Hashtag Ethan here along with Mrs. Snarky. Ah, yo! And yeah, we're moving on to part three, toughest part of the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's the recovery section and uh, talking about ending the legacy. So um, we've had like a couple of exercises to do in this part and there's exercises for like every chapter from here on out, I believe. So um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, by exercise, it means you write some things down, you think about your past, and you ball for and the you rest cry. of the evening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the fetal position, rocking, uh -huh. is usually part of it. Uh, I forgot my tissues. Oh, uh oh. Well. Mine's on well, the floor. I, well, I, I have, I promised this at, uh, several weeks ago, and I keep forgetting. And I even forgot this time, but Maddie just happened to be home. These are my panda balls! And what you do is... Well, I can't do it with my right hand. I have to do it with my left. Is you move them. And they make noise. And it's like mindfulness kind of thing. I don't use them very much. That's why I'm not good at using them, but... It's one of those things that you could do, I guess, when you're nervous or mm -hmm. something. Kind of like stimming. That'd yeah. Nice. Yeah. You come in a little case. My, my balls are <laughs> kept in this tiny little thing. Your balls have pandas on them. Yeah, my That's... balls are panda balls. And I also have bamboo. Bamboo balls. Mm. <laughs> yes. Nutritious bamboo. <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Pretty we much. totally have not been avoiding this. <laughs> uh, well, we had some tech issues come up, so. Yeah, we did. Zoom was, we thought Zoom was down, because it kind of was, mm -hmm. and turned out it was just that I had to uninstall Zoom and reinstall it, and now it works! Yay! <laughs> Hallelujah! Yay. Praise be to the spaghetti monster. <laughs> or Maddie, who came in here and helped. <laughs> Maddie is the secret spaghetti monster. Ooh. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Shh. Okay. Your secret's safe with me. Hey, And my, my panda balls are safe with this box. <laughs> yes. They're nice <laughs> and protected. Yeah. Oh... Alrighty then. So the nitty gritty, right? Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Where was I at? It's first steps, right? Um, yes. Chapter ten. Chapter okay. ten. I had finished it and I put my bookmark in the wrong spot. Oh. <laughs> so I was confused. So yeah. First steps. How it feels, not how it looks. Which is... Whoa, okay. Um, yeah, did you get a pop-up too? Yeah, I yeah. got a pop And I went, what? I was like, huh? What you now? Up you upgraded it? I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, so she starts out with um, a quote, of course, always at the beginning of chapters. I wish there were a mental health diagnosis for serial grief i'm not mentally ill mostly just sad and grieving the version of the mother i so desperately wanted from sunny who is 39. Mm -hmm. and that that quote really resonated with me and it, it made me think a lot about all the bouts of depression that i've had and all mm -hmm. that because it, it just always seemed to be tied to some kind of circumstance of course wasn't just for out of nowhere kind of thing it was oh. i was grieving it really made me think about that a lot um because honestly when you're raised by somebody who's narcissistic it a lot of the patterns are daily and if something occurs that makes you feel like you are a complete failure 
then it, boom, depression. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be right back. And, yeah. And it's it's really tough to deal with, and that is a good way of putting it. Serial grief. Mm -hmm. Oh. But yeah, um, she goes on to say, as a child growing up, you were likely very good at denying, numbing, or compensating for your own feelings rather than allowing yourself to feel them. You probably do this now as an adult too. Your recovery begins in this chapter. Here I will guide you to reclaim your emotions and enhance your sense of self. So that basically is um, what we're going to be, like. it's like a summary of what we're going to be discussing in this chapter. Um, now that you have a solid understanding of the psychological dynamics you were subject, subject to as a daughter of a narcissistic mother and how they adversely affected your life, it is time for you to come to terms with the past, release your unrealistic expectations of your mother, and take charge of your life to heal. Now it's your time to make your life more peaceful and comfortable. You will follow the blueprint, blueprint for healing in this chapter that I use for my own recovery and continue to use for my clients. It works if you follow the steps sequentially. If you feel worlds better than you ever have, or you will feel worlds better than you ever have. Read much, snarky? Ooh. Fuck. Um, however, it's important to note that you cannot completely cure the scars of childhood trauma. You work with them, process them, and learn how to deal with them differently so that you do feel better. And that is one thing that I think is really important to highlight is that you, there's no cure for this. There's mm -hmm. only coping with it. Yeah, I actually have that written down too. Um, this is very important. And like when, when talking about childhood abuse, a lot of people will be like, well, that was then and this is now. Like as soon as it's over or it's done, then it just disappears. Um, oh no. But yeah, there are certain things, certain um, psychological wirings, I guess you could say in my brain, that will probably never go away. There will always be some inkling of that because it happened from such a young age in mm -hmm. formative years, so. Yeah, the thinking patterns and behavioral patterns, they're in, they are neurological in a way. They manifest in patterns of thinking and behavior. And when you do that over and over and over again, it reinforces these uh, neurological pathways, these uh, ways of dealing with, and thus you have behavioral pattern. And really, I mean, <laughs> It doesn't point to one thing. It's not just genetics or just environment. It's mm -hmm. all of that together. Right. So it's it's hell soup. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It really is. When you have a traumatic childhood, it's hell soup. And uh, you can't just strain the bad out of it. Mm -hmm. It's still there. But what you can do is reflavor it mm -hmm. or use it in some way that is uh, easier to cope with and who knows you can make it chicken soup for the soul or <laughs> <some shit. laughs> write a book I don't know um, I really like her analysis here um, if you'll scroll to the uh, the tree mm -hmm. I really like this she says, I liken ourselves to a tree. Each of us, like a tree, has roots, our upbringing, long sturdy trunks, our development, and branches that flower and grow in our adult lives. Your trunk or development phase bears the scars, which really, which don't really go away. They're part of who we are, but recovery work helps us to treat any gashes, to fill them in, apply balm, and seal them gently and takes away the old recurring pain, changing the original trauma, allowing you to grow around it and up and away from it. Please keep this in mind so that you do not become discouraged and misled. Really, it's a relief to know that you don't have to totally remove those scars. The things that happen to us are important to acknowledge. They play into who we are today, yet they do not define who we are today. And by working in recovery, 
You refuse to allow your past to tell you who you are. You accept and face your past as part of you and you move on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really like this analogy. It's perfect, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so, too. I think it adequately um, kind of explains that, like, those roots never go away. So yeah. that's always going to be the same. The most we can do is try and heal the, the scars that have come from it. Oh, yeah. Yep, definitely. And there are methods to doing that, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, she has a three-step recovery model, which um, we've done um, step one, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, each individual will have to go through this process as well. You'll mm -hmm. have to gather background information, identify the problem, diagnose the problem, understand the problem on a cognitive level. In other words, um, how you think about it, what do you believe about it, and how do you behave because of your thinking and your beliefs about really you. Mm -hmm. uh, but also your beliefs about your mother and, you know, the family dynamic, your father, your sisters, your brothers, your, even your grandma and grandpa, mm -hmm. but, you know, these things do have to be analyzed and understood on that level of um, assessing who you are, really, because a lot of the scarring comes from um, the beliefs that you accrued during the time of hearing your mother say over and over again that, oh, this isn't good enough, or, you know, the way she responds mm -hmm. to, you know, you trying really hard to please her or to accomplish something, and she just poo-pooed all over it. Um, those tend to uh, give you the inherent belief that you'll never be good enough. Yeah. And that is a cognitive problem that um, it's one of the biggest ones, really, and, I mean, it's the title of the book. Right. So, so obviously, it's a key issue. Um, step two, and this is the really hard part, and that's the part that we're kind of going through right now, in this chapter, is process the feelings related to step one. Mm -hmm. um, so processing your background, how you identify, uh, or what you've identified as the problem, uh, coming to terms with the diagnosis and understanding that, your beliefs, uh, grieve, feel it, grieve and feel it. And that's the absolute toughest. Yeah, it really oh, is. Is allowing yourself to feel um, but she does give you some really helpful tips on how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and reprogramming, reprogram negative messages, which is also very key. Um, identify, feel it, deal with the feelings, reprogram your cognitive beliefs, your beliefs. Okay. Um, step three, and of course, as I said before, the reprogramming is so important, it's uh, pretty much the entirety of step three. Mm -hmm. Reframe, view differently, make decision to change, and change. So yeah, that's, that's tough too, but obviously step two is the most, the most tough. Yeah. Because you weren't, like, while going through it, you weren't really allowed to feel those feelings. No. So, and, like, when I thought about this step, uh, the first time I went through this book, I was like, oh, yeah, no big deal, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, you get into it, and you're like, oh, shit. Like, there's, there's a lot to unpack here that uh, I didn't realize was all sitting underneath the surface. It just wasn't right in front of my face. Yeah. When you're told, you know, that 
<sighs> anytime you express to mom that mom hurt your feelings because she didn't acknowledge all your hard work and effort and she's just like oh you know uh, you're just being what my mom would say histrionic right mm -hmm. you're just being histrionic you're just uh, trying to manipulate me make me feel bad and yada 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 and so it made me feel like I was the culprit. Right, yeah, you feel to blame in that situation that you shouldn't be feeling what you're feeling. Right, which leads inevitably to guilt. Mm -hmm. I just perpetually felt guilty for feeling my own feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that, that is toxic as fuck. Yeah. And uh, so Even yeah, now, that, even now I have a hard time like, if I, if I need to cry, um, I have a really hard time doing so. And yeah. you shouldn't, like, you should feel okay to do, I mean, obviously there are times and places for, for things, but, like, you should never deny that to yourself just because of this programming. Right. And that's really tough to get beyond. I mean, shoulds are... <laughs> yeah. Should it's a difficult word because who can say what you should and shouldn't do but the thing is when it arises you're tempted the pattern is you're tempted to just stomp it down just tamp those feelings down and at least don't show them mm -hmm. but they're still there they don't they don't disappear there, when you sweep things under the rug you get a big lump yeah there's a lump there <laughs> You can tell, and you can't walk properly on a rug with a bunch of lumps in it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good you gotta, analogy. You, you gotta, you gotta take the rug, peel it up, look at what's underneath, and deal with it. So, yeah, that's important to do. And one thing that I I like that she suggests in here. Uh, when she's talking about processing, when you actually are doing the the work, is you have to write it down. Yes. Write down what you're feeling mm -hmm. or what you're thinking about. And journal keeping is good for that, especially if you have issues with um, not being able to cry or express those feelings that are there underneath the surface great way to pry, pry them out is to write it down. Mm -hmm. Write down what your thoughts are. Face them. Because you have to actually look at that. Yeah. And read it and go, wow. And a lot of times, whenever I keep a journal, I discover so much about myself that I had no idea was there. Mm -hmm. So, journal keeping is a very good practice for people who have trouble with um, dealing with emotions. And, you know, she says, um, Snarky's kind of laid out the summary of the steps, but there's a part here where she says, processing feelings is very different than just talking about them. To process means to talk about the trauma and simultaneously feel the pain in a cacophonous blasting rock concert. You can tell something in a story form without feeling it, but that's not processing. This is the only way to release trauma from your body. And you know that there is a big difference. Like doing this series with you, when I'm on camera, I can kind of distance myself from right. the topic and yes. just tell a story. And, but when you do this work, when you sit down and you, you do these things, um, you, it, it's a, it's a different beast, uh, processing as opposed to just telling a story, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the learning to distance yourself from things was also reinforced working in veterinary medicine. You have to have distance there. Uh, right. You can't you know, be emotionally invested in every case that comes in, especially in a field where there is um, euthanasia. Um, right. Just An not, injury. And yeah. Lots of bad stuff. Yeah. 
you do have to be very clinical in your approach. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what, when we're making these videos, we are taking a clinical approach mm -hmm. to uh, recovery. So it's totally different. And I, I do want to point out psychodynamics is bullshit. So uh, what, is, what is psychodynamics? <laughs> Uh, it's basically when you, you know how you get the psychiatrist and you lay on the couch and, well, tell me about your mom <laughs> and you just talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's basically talk therapy. Okay. And I mean, it's good to talk about it, but you'll be talking about it for years mm -hmm. without processing. Processing is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh yeah yeah i'm a big fan of um the psychologist that i see will take you know bring something up and be like oh well this is really hard and he'll come up with a way to explain it um in like analogy form that applies to the the situation and he'll even use examples from his own life and be yeah. like you know hey this is he has issues with chronic pain too and so like but it's it's hearing things explained in such a way that you understand more why you're going through the things that you're going through and then once you understand the why what can I do to change that yeah exactly you have to be able to identify the source mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just dealing with symptoms and you're playing whack-a-mole with mm -hmm. symptoms and you're never going to get anywhere with that. So I like the whole cacophonous blasting rock concert because for some reason it's just like, I think Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> 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 and it's just kind of like, it starts out, I'm, you know, writing down things in my journal and then all of a sudden, there comes this moment where it's like, ah, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it just the tears come, mm -hmm. the tears and the sobbing, and the you, you come to a realization, and it's it's good, it's good for you to clean that all that out. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I think she mentions here, when people skip step two of recovery the hard part the, the facing the the feeling facing the demons yeah <laughs> yeah the damn pesky fifis <laughs> um if you skip that step three doesn't work mm -hmm. and this is very simple if you don't know if you don't connect the beliefs to the feelings then reframing it doesn't it feels disingenuous mm -hmm. Because it is, because you don't know what you're dealing with. You have mm -hmm. to actually... You're still not feeling the feelings. Yes. If you attach the feeling to what's going on and that reframing, then it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, let's see. Where was I at? I believe that this is why many therapeutic programs are unsuccessful, because folks skip the middle. The difficult part we have to clean out trauma before we can learn to look at our situation in a healthy and different way and to go back to the rug analogy if you just keep those lumps under the rug and you vacuum you vacuum you vacuum you might get some of the shit from under the rug but not all of it mm -mm. not the majority of it yeah it's still gonna be under there so yeah um, all right, so step three is about reframing a therapeutic word that means looking at the problem through another set of lenses or in a new way. This is the fun part of recovery. When you begin to see things differently and become free of the symptoms and the effect of the trauma of having a narcissistic mother, you make decisions for yourself that are very different than when you were feeling like a victim of wrongdoing or when you felt guilty for every fucking step you made mm -hmm. that's not in the book those yeah. Are <laughs> yeah those are those yeah, are she, she she doesn't go fucking fucking guilt <laughs> motherfucker ah uh, but guilt is definitely a big part of this mm -hmm. so you begin to get in touch with your real feelings 
your real feelings, values, and belief system. You find the authentic you and allow it to function your own way. This is freedom, and I wish this for every reader who is there with me. So when your mom tells you, you know, your feelings aren't valid, basically when she says, you know, I don't want to hear your feelings or you're just being histrionic or she dismisses it in any way, the message she is giving you is those feelings are not valid. Yeah. You are being dishonest. And so you don't know who you are. You don't know what your authentic feelings are when you're given that message over and over again. So the feeling part is important just for that reason alone. Just that reason alone is mm -hmm. enough to deal with them. So, so but yeah. it's not, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's not fun, but damn it, do it. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's so worth it. Um, but yeah, so the next section, a closer look at recovery. We move now to specifics for healing the unmothered child. The five basic areas to be covered in part three of this book are listed here for easy reference. So, number one, accepting your mother's limitations and allowing yourself to grieve. And that's a huge part of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, number two, separating psychologically from mother and reframing the negative messages. Step three, working on your authentic sense of self. Step four, dealing with mother and your relationship with her in a healthy way. And step five, treating your own narcissistic traits and refusing to pass on the legacy to your own children. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we already did that part. Right, <laughs> we did a whole chapter on that. So. Not doing that again. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. That is something that I will continue to look at, mm -hmm. like, day to day, day to day. Because I'm not a mother on just Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. No? Nope. You don't send them off to, like, Mars for a few days? Nope. <laughs> and even if I did, I would still be like, oh my god, my children are Mars! Right, yeah. No! Yeah, I imagine it's a daily worry, just a constant in the back of your head. Like, what if I'm like mom? What if, what if I do what mom did? What if this? What if that? And sometimes I do. Sometimes what mom did wasn't all bad. You know, things mm. aren't dichotomous. Not my mother wasn't just the the pure symbol of evil, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were good things too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's complicated human relationships and human beings individuals are complex yes very so speaking of which <laughs> uh, <laughs> to realize that your own mother may not be capable of real love and empathy is shocking if you ever allow yourself to think this before you might have been unwilling to accept it Mothers are supposed to be the most reliable source of love, comfort, empathy. And if your mother did not provide that for you, you most likely denied your feelings about it. Daughters often blame themselves for their mother's inability to love them. Uh, remember my client who said, if my own mother can't love me, who can? Mm -hmm. Accepting their mother's limitations is difficult for all daughters. Oof. Yeah. Yep, and I still tend to hear um, outsiders' voices when talking about this topic that say things like, she did the best she could, or she was still your mother, you should respect her memory, or it couldn't have been that bad. Um, and because of those um, phrases, I still tend to make excuses for it, or downplay it and say, well, you know, oh, I shouldn't complain because other people have it worse. Um, but that's just, it's not the case. Like, <laughs> trauma is trauma is trauma. Yeah. Um, you can't just, it's not a competition. It's not, you know, yeah, sure, there's a scale there, but your trauma is still your trauma. Yeah, no, about, no amount of whataboutism is going to change what happened. Mm-hmm. It's still bad. 
Just because other things are worse. It's like, my foot hurts. But, oh, well, at least it's not your head, I guess. <laughs> it's like, uh, that doesn't take away the pain in my foot. Right, it doesn't do anything. No. Except but... make you thankful that that doesn't hurt, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's the point, is, oh, well, I guess I should be this or that. No, there's no should. Mm -hmm. There's no should. They're just what is and what you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And that kind of um, goes into what she says right after. Before you can grieve, you have to accept the reality of what you have gone through. Think of it like this. A teacher trying to teach a three-year-old to read at college level might feel disappointment, anger, and even shame at his failure to accomplish this goal. Until he realizes, of course, that the student is not really capable of this task. Most narcissists lack the capacity to give significant, authentic love and empathy, and you have no choice but to deal with this reality. Accepting that your own mother has this limited capacity is the first step. Let go of the expectation that it will ever be different. Yeah, and that's a perfect way of putting it because what you're dealing with is, or what we were dealing with, is mothers who were not emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. They were not emotionally intelligent enough to know that you have to nurture your child. It's important to comfort them and empathize with them. But they didn't, they didn't have that capacity mm -hmm. because they weren't emotionally intelligent. I mean, it, it sounds bad, but I mean, it is kind of like that. It's like they were toddlers on that level it's like they were third graders and you know being a mother is some college level shit <laughs> right. uh, so <laughs> i mean they might be able to deal with i don't know their sister or something but but not a child uh -uh. Not, not a child and that was just their limit you know, and we have to live with their mistakes, the mistakes that they made because they weren't equipped. Yeah. And another big thing is, you know, when I stopped talking to mom, um, I would call my sister Jenny a lot. And I remember one phone call and I was like, but I miss her. And she goes, eh, you really don't. And I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, obviously I miss her. And she goes, you are kind of miss, like, what, what do you want right now? And I'm like, well, I wish, you know, I could tell her about bad things that are happening in my life and, you know, get advice from her. And she goes, but has she ever done that? You know, have you ever had a good conversation where she, you know, was 100% focused on you, gave you decent advice, was just there for you. And I was like, well, no, I, you know, I guess not. And she goes, you're missing what you want mom to be. You're mm -hmm. not actually missing her. You're not missing the abuse. You're not missing uh, shit like that. But, like, you're, you're missing this image of this mom that yeah. is not there. <laughs> Your ideal mom. Yeah. Which yeah. is later in the chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, really, I mean, even still, after all that we went through with mom, we still have that ideal in our heads. Mm -hmm. And we try to project that onto her, especially after death, mm -hmm. which, you know, both of our moms had passed away. So that's kind of the level that we're at is projecting this idealism onto them and it really it's it's typical but it's not healthy right yeah uh reality is reality and we must face it and our feelings about it so which is not fun mm -hmm. it's very painful it's very uh i have anger problem uh, so, 
<laughs> I went through the anger stage over and over again. I still go through it. Like, anger. yeah, I still have times where I get mad. Yeah, I just want to smash her face. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. When I think about all the stuff, but. Mm. Oh, what you gonna do? Uh, recover, I guess. <laughs> yeah, work on it. <laughs> cope, mm -hmm. cope with it. Um. Oh, this is. <laughs> she says most daughters I know have gone through long periods in their lives not understanding this, always wishing and hoping that the next encounter with their mother will be different. This sets up not only unrealistic expectations for the daughter, but encourages her to keep going back to try again, for which the reward is additional sadness, disappointment, ang pain, anger, and exasperation. Uh -huh. After all, we're talking about your mother, the person who was the center of your world and for whom you loved and needed more than anyone else. I want to acknowledge again how difficult this is to do, but you must do it so you can move on toward your own recovery. And yeah, that's basically what we were just talking about. It's funny. Because I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> so I read this week and a half, two, three, I don't know. Long yeah, time we ago. were prepared to record. It's just we weren't able to. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we both kind of did the work um, a while back. Yeah. <laughs> on this chapter. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh my gosh. <sighs> so the next, um, at least the next bit that I have marked down is the last paragraph in this section. And it says, in all events, however, the success of the recovery work rests entirely with you, the daughter. Let go of the belief that your mother can or will be different and will ever be able to give you the love you deserve. Letting go will free you and allow you to find yourself. Decide to accept and realize that mom's inability, her incapacity, her illness, her limitations have hurt you. This beginning step takes you out of denial and forces you to deal with reality. It is a move towards health. Decide now. This act will give you back the control you need to pursue the important grief process that follows. And yeah, this just goes back to uh, something that I've mentioned before, that a, a person's mental health is their responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. just like um, your physical health. You know, for instance, I have medications that I need to take yep. daily. And if somebody else takes those, um, they're still going to be taken, uh, but they're gonna, it's not going to do me a world of difference. So No, it's definitely not. So, yeah, I mean, this is, it was also hard to get to this point. I know the first time I read it, I just reacted with anger, you know, like you had gone through. And it was just, but I want to blame her. I want her to take responsibility. And, yeah, I mean, you can blame her for the abuse, sure. Um, but moving on and coping, that's all on you right now. It's a yeah. huge responsibility, but it's on you. Yeah, uh, we, we're the ones that have to be our own mothers now, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're the ones that have our own inner dialogue. We're the ones that know our problems. We're the ones that can advise ourselves, you know, as adults. And that's really tough to do when you haven't been raised properly and given the, uh, the tools needed. But, you know, I do want to highlight when it comes to this whole taking responsibility. We don't need mom to take responsibility. The responsibility is on her ass. Mm -hmm. Like, just like you're responsible for you, you didn't take it, did you? Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't, you didn't physically, like, it's just there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, taking responsibility is actually the action of being responsible. But her actions she did so mm -hmm. she is responsible mm -hmm. that's kind of the way i see it like whether whether bitch face acknowledges it or not she did the shit mm -hmm. that's that's just kind of how i see it maybe that's just kind of my anger seeing it that way i don't think you know? so 
you know, but, her, her responsibility is her responsibility, and there's nothing you can really do about that. No, because she's definitely not gonna, like, for one, she's dead. Right, and yeah. Even if she were alive, she wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I, I did these things. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not gonna, no, ever. No. Ever. But nonetheless, she fucking did. Mm -hmm. So the onus is ona. <laughs> uh, goodness. All right. So the grief process. Whoa. Wait, where are you? <laughs> How do I know? I have totally accepted. Okay. I am in the I'm in the right spot. <laughs> well, how do I know? I've totally accepted mother's limitations. <sighs> how do I know? How do I know? <laughs> you really love me. Okay. I say um, <laughs> Yeah, we don't pray about it, but what we do is uh, to determine where we are in the process of accepting mother's limitations, we ask ourselves the following questions. One, do I continue to wish and hope that my mother will be different each time I talk to her? Well, for me personally, no, mama did. Mm -hmm. so, but if she were still alive, probably would. I don't can't really say. Um, that... When I went no contact, I did for quite a while. Um, but eventually I got to a place where, like, I wished she was different, but I also knew that it wasn't going to be different. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> totally does. Totally does. Wish in one hand, shit in the other, right? <laughs> That's, you know which one's going to fill up first. Mm -hmm. All right, number two. Do I continue to have expectations of my mother? Now, I'm going to go back to the she did thing. But at the same time, you know, we can also reflect upon memories. Like, what mm -hmm. are my expectations of those memories? Am I remembering it? in an idealized way or am I remembering it the way it happened? So that's that's one way of reframing it if your mother is no longer alive or in the picture or what have you, mm -hmm. um, that you can question these kind of things. Uh, three, have I accepted my mother for who she is? Now this is tough because mm -hmm. As we said before, there are good things and bad things. Really bad things. Mm -hmm. um, things that we're angry about, things that we're sad about, things that we continue to struggle with that mom did. Do we accept that? That is who she is and... As yeah. my mother always loved to say, I've been this way my whole life and if you don't like it, there's the door. Um, which is ironically what she said to me right before I went no contact because I had to I had to say that I tried everything um, before going no contact and my last right. the last thing I tried was I said I will go to group therapy I will go to family therapy with you but that is the only way I'm continuing to talk to you and she's she right. used that line I've been like this my whole life I'm not going to change and if you don't like it there's the door so Mm, I took that's the hurtful. Door. Yeah. 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 I think, I'd say you took the right option because if she's not willing to see anything mm -hmm. or take any <laughs> any effort to change whatsoever, then there's no point. Mm -hmm. Wow. But I mean, I knew, you know, and and that helped me make the decision a little bit better in that. You know, I didn't just walk away um, at the beginning, which I couldn't have because this was lifelong, but um, I just, I needed that reassurance that I, 
I tried. Yeah. Well, and she gave you the ultimatum, so. Mm. All right, you made your decision. Um, all right, number four. Oh, I didn't even answer the question. Um, as far as acceptance of my mother for who she was, some parts, yes. There's other parts that really don't make sense to me about who she was. And I'm still trying to understand that. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, I can answer yes. It's, it's not it's not like a simple question to answer for me right now. Right, yeah. Uh, there are some parts that I can't accept because I don't understand. Right, yeah. And that's a good way to put it because, yeah, there are certain aspects of you know, how she treated us and how she treated people that I just couldn't imagine doing. And, yeah. um, it just like you said, it, you can't understand it. So if you can't understand it, um, that kind of puts a barrier up for acceptance. Yeah. And one of the major things I think was like, I know how she was raised, like from depictions that her sisters and she herself and knowing my grandparents and things like that it's really difficult for me to wrap my head around because she was she was the prize of the family mm. she was intelligent she made great grades she was athletic she was you know the apple of her dad's eye and I really, she would talk about just how encouraged she was by that, di that dynamic, but yet with me, I was nothing but a disappointment. Mm -hmm. So it was really, it's really weird. I really don't understand that aspect of it. And maybe it's this whole opposite thing opposite parenting styles you know she took the dramatic opposite approach or i don't know i always just kind of felt like i wasn't her kid mm. like she just didn't accept that i was hers that's mm. that sucks right. yeah so maybe that's it maybe i was dad's kid not hers um, mm. maybe that's the way she viewed it i don't know i don't think i'll ever get an answer to that and it's that's why it's kind of hard for me to accept some of the stuff uh. um, in terms of who she was. All right, so, <coughs> pardon me. Four, am I expecting someone else to meet my childlike needs because I have given up on my mother? <laughs> um, for me, I have done that in the past. Uh -huh. And now, now I don't have that expectation. I feel like I've come to a place where I can give it to myself. I've got like this kind of inner mother thing, figure, <laughs> I guess, mm -hmm. which sounds, I don't know, like multiple personality or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but honestly, it's kind of like I was talking about before. I'm an adult, I'm at a place where I know that I can give others good advice and I can guide other people and I can have empathy for other people. And I know that I can apply that to myself. So I don't really feel that urge to have a mother figure anymore mm -hmm. because of that. So Yeah, I used to do it with um, romantic relationships. I would want my worth solidified by the person I was with and, you know, impress them and, you know, try to be good enough. And uh, I don't expect that anymore. Um, learning that I was doing it, I didn't even realize I was doing it until it was kind of spelled out. But yeah i think i think with this one i'm pretty comfortable cool. all right number five do i continue to get my childlike needs met in relationships instead of relying on myself it's kind of the same question but worded differently yeah they're very similar 
Yeah. <laughs> See, uh, expectation is one thing and trying is another. Uh-huh. So, uh, like, sometimes I do. Like, when I'm sick, I'm really whiny. Like, I'm dying. <sighs> but honestly, like, like, I've been injured the past few months, and I hate not being able to do things on my own. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I kind of have this, like, reverse thing where I would rather take care of someone else than them take care of me. Mm-hmm. And that makes me feel... So I didn't have a childhood. I wasn't the kid. I was always the caretaker. Uh-huh. So maybe the dynamic is a little different for me. Maybe my childlike need is to take care of someone. It could be. You know, because it was so like that. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, all right, so number six. Am I looking for a man to replace my mother? And I was for a very long yeah. time. Yeah, I... I never really thought of it that way. I mean, I I mean, I have thought of it that way, but at the same time, I never like there's no man out there that could replace mom. Yeah, no. Thinking about it as a concept, it's just like, well, duh, no, but and, yeah, and even in terms of the needs, motherly needs that I desire aren't really something that I look for in a man. I guess, Mm -hmm. like, some of them maybe, like, you know, being there for you and, you know, but I don't know, like, with, with my relationships, like, that, it's more like friends, Mm -hmm. like, friendship kind of thing, Mm -hmm. and with other, a lot of the relationships that I have where I was looking more for a mother was like, it would always be my best friend. <laughs> um. It would always be like an older woman, usually, that I would be friends with, that I would look up to as a mentor. It would usually be that kind of person that mm. I would look to replace my mother. That was my strategy, I guess. Yeah. It didn't work out. Right. <laughs> it was not. Never really does. <laughs> No. <laughs> All right. Number seven. Do I feel a sense of entitlement about my needs? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm entitled to have my needs met. Honestly, I've had the opposite problem. Yeah. I feel like my needs never mattered enough. Mm-hmm. And that I had to earn... Um, any kind of positive in re- anything. <laughs> yeah. Recognition that I have needs at all is yeah tough for me. I, I hate having needs. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, if I could just ignore those and fo- yeah. focus on somebody else's needs, that, that'd be cool. I'll yeah. Do that. Like, I heal my own needs by taking care of someone else. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, yeah. Oh, boy. Am I now relying on myself to meet most of my needs? And when someone else is there for me, do I see it as an added blessing rather than my due? Which is kind of the same question worded differently again. Mm -hmm. But it also has the caveat of, am I relying on myself to meet most of my needs? Yeah. And... Yeah, I am. I mean, honestly, I always have. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I didn't have mom to rely on. I didn't have dad to rely on. Like, even the people that I could have potentially relied on, I was kept away from. Mm. So... Yeah, it's always been like, a, oh my god, thank you! Mm-hmm. I'm so blessed! Hashtag blessed! <laughs> um, right. Yeah, I don't expect it, really. Um, the, 
See, the, the part that I get kind of hung up on is I am relying on myself to meet my needs, but at the same time, I'm not doing a very good job in some areas. Yeah, me too. So, um, that's kind of my hang up. But yeah, I think I, I do see it as like, um, an added blessing that I, I question sometimes. Like, why are you being nice to me? Like, what do you want? in return yeah but. yeah me too that's that's a curse yeah <laughs> that's a definite curse feel like uh, i don't know just i've looked up different personality disorders and i've taken like all these tests and stuff like that and what i get often is schizotypal because i'm so paranoid about other people and their motives mm. right? so yeah it's definitely a struggle for me i think i get that a lot from my parents as well because they were very paranoid about other people yeah and i'm kind of mild in that department by contrast but it's still pretty bad mm -hmm. uh what do you want from me casey <laughs> right what what do you expect in return sir <laughs> Give me all your, I don't know, my, no. I don't have much, so <laughs> I think give I, me have, a, I have like $10, I think. Give me beaver nuggets. Mm. And I'll give you panda balls. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Oh, boy. Balls. So, when you've successfully completed the acceptance part of recovery, you realize that no one can really meet your childhood needs. And you choose number eight above. The part of life where you were entitled to that kind of maternal nurturing is gone. You're willing to grieve the loss, but fully understand you can't go back and get it, and you can't make it happen now with someone else. Remember, as an adult, you're not entitled to this. You're responsible for yourself, now willing to accept this accountability for your own needs and find a way to meet them. In this place, you are ready to grieve. But yeah, that was that was the first part of chapter t 10, right? 10? Yeah, 10. I'm going all the way back, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so we'll cover the rest because there is quite a bit left uh, next time. We don't want to like go too long here. But uh, thank you for being here. Do you want to show yourself? I didn't have you show yourself at the beginning. <gasps> Bad host. What's that a show? Like, <laughs> hi, I'm Mrs. Snarky. I don't have a channel anymore, I guess. I don't know. I'll be back at some point. I keep trying to get motivated to do it, but this thing's the bad just keeps happening. And, uh, I mean, it's been really difficult to just get me here. <laughs> so... I mean, imagine my self-motivation for a moment. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's at some point, I have a channel, I do stuff sometimes. Um, used to could. Used to could! <laughs> um, I also do art, buy my art, woohoo! Um, the vaginas and the titties, you know. <laughs> usual, the usual jokes and stuff. Yay! Yay! Thanks for being here and listening to me ramble. But yeah, um, all the links are in the description, so check them out. It's worth it. <laughs> they, <laughs> they didn't see you, because it's there. If you make oh. noise. <laughs> oh, of there. course, now it doesn't do it either. What the fuck? What? Okay, if you're gonna make me do it a third time, I mean, that's, that's just... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yay! It is down there. <laughs> that's where that's where I keep my balls. See. Yeah, ooh. I see my balls. Your musical balls. They're very pretty. The ball jokes. <laughs> Beaver nuggets. Yes. I lied. I lied to y'all. I'm sorry. I lied to y'all. <laughs> there's my show portion of the show thank you <laughs> but yeah thank you for being here um, we get into more hard stuff later but uh, that that is enough for now um, huh? 
Oof. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Oof. That's yeah. the rest of this book could just be titled Oof. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Oof da. Oof da. But yeah, um, join us next time. Um, we'll we'll finish up chapter ten, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So make sure to hang around for the bloopers. Uh, there'll be a couple. Bloop, bloop. Boop, boop. <laughs> but yeah, um, thanks for being here. And remember, life can be shit. It definitely is right now. Mm. So keep hanging in there with hashtag and Mrs. Turkey. Bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay. I should have. Test should've recording. Hair check. Holy shit. <laughs> I just keep doing the same thing with mine. It just goes in a ponytail. That's about I it. Sh I should have done that. <laughs> but then I look really weird. Yeah. I got a big face. My big face. <laughs> uh. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. I'm saying some stuff for the recording. It's important. <laughs> Should we do a ball test? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the panda balls. Christy. Ah, I can hear them. <laughs> they like wind chimes. Oh yeah, they do. They totally do. Well, and so now nice. she's trying to get under the blanket. Oh. Uh, see, when you want her to do something, she's not going to do it. Of That's course. That's how that works. There. Tomokalo. <laughs> Tomokalo? Tomokalump. Oh, Tomokalump. Yes. That's even better. <laughs> Oh, we have to wear a sock and a cane. Well, I can't wear the cane, but I use it. To go down the ramp? Yeah, I would have to. Okay. We are good to go. I am recording. <laughs> it's tradition. Oh, shoot. I gotta... Has the UPS guy showed up yet? Uh, no, but I think the mail came because that light was in the mail. Ooh. Uh, Maybe we shall get a blessing upon this stream. <laughs> well, for sure there will be a grocery delivery at three, so we'll have the doorbell. <laughs> giggity! I don't know why that's giggity, it's really not. But yeah. Yay! Oh, yeah. <sighs> I see it. What am I like clicking things? What's going on? Mm -hmm. I full I full screened it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I had the book, I guess, on the keyboard. Oh. And it was doing things and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I'm surprised your groceries ain't here yet. I know. <laughs> well, maybe he just didn't ring the bell. Hey, honey. Greg. Uh, he's probably got me tuned out at this point. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nope, I want messages. Did the I'll play with my play with my balls. There you go. Ling a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling. My dinglings. <laughs> what was I gonna say? If they don't ring the bell, yell at me. I need to stop biting my lip. If 
this really bad habit of like biting at the dry skin and then pulling it off. Yeah, me too. Humans are weird. Maybe this will help. Maybe. Stop biting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, no interruption. No groceries interruptus yet. All right. Well, I guess we can get on to the hard part. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's gonna just be kind of awkward if we're getting into it and then... I know! <laughs> right? And it's like, okay. Um, so... But we can is, end it here. This is totally my fault because we're late. Oh, um, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but we did... I mean, how long have we been here? Like, uh, is it an episode's worth? Yeah, um, we've been recording for an hour, so. Oh, okay. Well, do you want to make up some bloopers? <laughs> I don't know. Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. We gotta do an outro. Yeah, we have to do that. That's true. Okay. We can't just, like, cut it off there. <laughs> yeah. All right, y'all. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, love you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off now! <laughs> Get on out of here. That's the East Texas goodbye. <laughs> Get, on. Get on out of here. <laughs> uh, I thought it was the y'all come back now, you hear? No, that's hillbillies. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that was <laughs> a... <laughs> Get the banjo out, or the fiddle. Yeah. Uh, but... That's, we, we grew up watching The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Um, that was a really good film to, you know, show your kids from a very early age. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah her sign-off is, y'all yeah, come back now, you hear, so. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I could see that. I mean, I didn't really hear it that much, I don't think. Not that I recall. Oh, well, later, y'all, or... <laughs> Love you. Tell your mom and them I said hi. Yeah, <laughs> right. Give my best to you and yours. <laughs> uh. Oh, that was way too enunciated. <laughs> That's true. If you're if you're living very close to Louisiana, you kind of all your words just kind of flow together. Mm -hmm. They're drawn out really long, so they have to. Yeah, they kind of overlap. <laughs> If you don't get anything said now. <laughs> <laughs>